I am Margaret Toscano, and I am a scholar of Mormon studies. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our final conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano, we'll talk about one of Mormonism's most unique beliefs, that God has a body. The Nicene Creed says that God is without body, parts, or passions, and is both, therefore, male and female. There are some Mormon intellectuals who don't like this idea of a gendered God and kind of embrace this more Nicene theology as superior. Dr. Margaret Toscano will explain why she disagrees with those and thinks that a, a God with a body makes more sense. Check out our conversation. So I was going to say that, that these questions come up when we're talking about God. Um, so, you know, there's always more to think about, right? And so with God, a lot of people will say, well, obviously, you know, the whole thing about God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them and all of that, that, you know, well, does that mean that God is also female, right? But then it's a long, long theological argument about if we have God in a certain image, whether a male body or a female body, then, and, and is it a white body? Is it a black body? Is it a Mediterranean kind of body? <laughs> My mother-in-law, who was from Sicily, right? That's Paul's ancestry, had very beautiful dark olive skin. Is it Mediterranean? Is it black? Is it white? Um, and of course, white has predominated in how we've depicted God, right? right? But how does that influence how people can relate to being made in the image of God? So... Um, so some people will argue, well, let's, let's get beyond a God with gender. Let's not have yes. any g God with gender, right? Just a God who's, it's the spirit force. Um, and I mean, I think that there's something powerful about that, but you also, it, it's not as though, that was really the, the theological view that was developed by Christian theologians in early Christianity. And as I like to say, it, that view never helped women because really that kind of God beyond gender was still pictured as male. <laughs> it was kind of like God without sexuality and kind of the spirit and all of that. But, um, but there are problems either way. And this is the problem in theology, right? Or, and, and the problems are even more complex when you get to the nature of God. Because you could say, well, or if you say, well, God is male and female, this Mary is kind of the heavenly parents, like we get in Mormonism, then it's like, well, what about LGBTQ people, right? Um, I think it's interesting that you could propose in Mormonism that Joseph Smith's view of sort of a council of gods could solve this problem. But people really dislike this because both it sounds like polytheism from Greek mythology, right? And, um, and also, you know, I guess just the idea that of, we don't like to talk about sex and God in the same sentence, right? Even when we talk about heavenly parents, it's kind of like, don't mention sex. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sex is, you know, sex and God in the same sentence. Believe me, I did my dissertation on these issues. So, you know, people don't like to talk about that. It's embarrassing. Don't, let, don't talk about that. Um, but it is an interesting issue in Mormonism if you embody a god, right? So you think Mormonism could embrace gay marriage, essentially? Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, I think it could. Because to me, the issue is not, you know, the, the issue of marriage is not being male and female. Although, again, see, I'm different than some people that are advocating for this because I don't want to get rid of male and female. I think that male and female are essential parts of reality in the cosmos. But I think that we could be more expansive in how we viewed things. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and I'm just speculating here. Who really knows, right? right? So for me, that's, you know, I mean, you could approach this from a more and point of view by talking about the council of gods and that you could have Elohim, who is male and female, and then maybe other kinds of gods that reflect other uh, identities. But of course, most people like to just, let's just get beyond gender. Let's not think of God as, as having a body. Well, and that's, to me, that's kind of a Trinitarian point of view, isn't it? It is. And I think again, so I asked the question, you know, I mean, 
Christianity already tried to deal with that, and they and really theologians bought into the idea of God is beyond gender. But somehow over the centuries, God still had these this male identity, even though it was supposed to be beyond gender. So it never really solved it. And the other issue is that um, that I think that there's something very powerful. And this goes back to a Joseph Smith concept of embodying something. We live in a physical world. Is it possible to have love without embodiment? And actually, I just gave the paper where I met you, Rick, at UVU, which I didn't get to give my whole paper, so it didn't come through, I know. But I was trying to argue about how embodying something makes it real and concrete in a way that you don't get otherwise. So if we want to get away from the shocking polytheism that nobody really wants to return to, other than maybe me, I like Greek mythology, <laughs> right? But there's another concept that I think is in Mormon scriptures that deals with this too. And that is, I think that if I really search the scriptures and try to understand something about the nature of God, Current Mormonism tends to really, because again, I think we're reacting to Trinitarianism of kind of this embodied God. And there is something very powerful about, you know, Jesus coming down and being embodied or the Heavenly Father of Heavenly Parents as these loving parents, right? I mean, there's something very powerful about that. But in, if you look at Mormon scripture, so we like to emphasize sort of God as having a body. But the Mormon scriptures really talk about a combination of the, of, uh, in Strangers and Paradox, there's a whole chapter called The God of Flesh and Glory. The idea that you have an embodied God, but God also has this glory. And the way that I've described it sometimes, and really DNC 88, where it talks about that Christ is in the light of the sun and the moon, and it talks about this this uh, light that centers in Christ and emanates throughout the universe. It's a really powerful, wonderful, I think really central scripture in describing the nature of God. The way that I see it is that God is this powerful glory spirit that emanates, maybe you can think of Star Wars, like the force that goes throughout the whole universe in a sense, is like this matrix, this matrix of mind and spirit that underlies the whole physical world and keeps, it, it animates and keeps the whole world alive. And it's the spirit that is talked about as the, it, the sun shines on the wicked and the righteous this spiritual power, and I would see it as that this, the mind of God, the glory of God, the spirit of God is this powerful thing, and I would see it as androgynous, that it is without gender that goes throughout the whole world. But then at the center of this glory, that what is called in the scriptures the throne of God, is God male and female. But then, and this sounds really Gnostic suddenly, but then... I think that if you look at, again with Joseph Smith, if you have the notion of that from the central God, you have a council of gods, and in a sense it could be implied in the temple, that there are all kinds of ways of manifesting the glory and the presence, the embodiment of God, that includes a wide variety of races and sexualities, because I see the Spirit of God as loving this kind of variety and beauty and that all of us reflect the reflect God. So I guess what I'm trying to produce is a theology that doesn't lose male and female, just like I said with priesthood, but that also has something more encompassing that's more inclusive and that allows a variety and a diversity. So that's kind of my latest thing, is I'm trying to develop those. So in that talk that you heard me give that I didn't get to give the whole thing, I focused on the scripture in Nephi, 1 Nephi 11. And I think it's really interesting that 
Dan Peterson has taken the tree of life metaphor in there and connected it with Asherah mm -hmm. from the Old Testament. And I'm fine with that. I think it's really interesting how much that's caught on. But what he doesn't focus on, that in that scripture, when Nephi wants to understand the love of God, and this is also really important that you're thinking of it, not just, oh, here's the Heavenly Mother, but it's an answer to a question about what does the tree mean, and the ultimate answer is the love of God. So maybe I'll kind of draw back and contextualize again. So in a way, what I'm trying to deal with are two tensions or maybe paradoxes. One is, is there, you know, a truth about God that's revealed versus speculating about problems that any picture of God uh, presents. So as soon as you start talking about the nature of God, it, you know, it's, even if you say something that sounds really good, it creates other problems because the question, issues about the identity and nature of God are so connected to um, about, about humans, this whole notion of we're in the image of God and what does that mean? So it becomes really complicated. So trying to say on the one hand, is there revealed truth, but how do we solve some of these conundrums that if you look at the history of Christianity we've had? And then the question of, on the one hand, the idea of an embodied God is so powerful. I think that's the the power of the Christian message, that God didn't stay up, removed up in his heavens, but that God comes down. And that's the message in the Book of Mormon. God condescends, condescends, which literally means comes down with, not in a negative sense. God condescends and God is with us. That's so powerful. The picture of Jesus I mean, I have to say that the New Testament, I love it, this powerful God. Well, how can you fit a female into that without, you know, some of these other problems? So I'll finish on this idea of 1 Nephi 11. So Dan Peterson emphasizes the tree of life as the mother God and connects it back to the Asherah. And, you know, and I agree with that. But what he leaves out is why bring in Mary? Why bring in Mary? And how is Mary connected to the tree of life? And what I see when I read that verse is that Mary is a manifestation of the mother God. Just as Jesus, is a, the son, is a manifestation of the father, that in that vision, which is a Mormon vision, not Catholic, but Mormon, that Mary represents the love of God. And it's interesting that when he, Nephi says, what does the tree mean? He sees the maiden, Mary. And she represents, but she's a female form. And then, first he sees her alone, and then he sees her holding the baby. And then he sees this vision of how Christ is going to come and redeem his people by being embodied. But that image of the woman holding the child, which is the Madonna and child, and very very moving in art, right? The Madonna and child. It's a symbol of the love of God. But my point here is that it's not some abstract principle. I mean, I have felt it, and probably you have too, where you feel the love of God inside you. But the idea of that the love of God is not just simply a nice feeling, but it has to be manifest in concrete ways in the real and living world with how we interrelate with each other. And that's what this symbol is, that the father and mother come down to be with us, to help us in our trials, to hold us like the baby, that love has to be concrete. It's not just simply an abstract, nice feeling. Love is embodied in everyday actions and how we relate to each other, how we treat each other. And that symbolizes that. And that is the mother. That is the mother's love. The mother's love is that concrete thing. And so, you know, it's one thing to say, well, it's Asherah. Okay, she's this goddess in the Old Testament. But to me, what Nephi's vision does is he takes 
the Hebrew Bible and he Christianizes it and shows us the importance of Christ coming down among us, the mother coming down among us as this mother who will nurture her children. And I believe strongly that I think that the mother is among us. She's just not this heavenly mother that's up there, but that like Christ, I believe in God, in, in the heavenly parents who nurture their children in the here and now. Because really, I suppose that's what brings everything together that I've talked about, Rick, is the idea that I think the contribution of Mormonism to Christian history and theology is the notion that, that heaven and earth have to be brought together, that the earth is holy, the physical is holy, and that when you bring Zion above with Zion below, that this creates this this powerful thing that is really what we need to redeem the earth here and now. It's not just in the hereafter, but it's bringing the spiritual and the physical, all of these paradoxes together. So is that a good conclusion for you? <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, at any rate. So. Well, do you have any last thoughts you want to share? Well, I've kind of said a lot, so I think it's enough, probably. <laughs> Are you working on any new books or anything? I'm you know working that? on, um, I actually... Um, <laughs> I suppose that at this point I've already written about these things, but you can always say them in a different context. So I'm working on a book called The, the Mormon Mother God, Her Theology, Symbols, and Importance. And then I want to do well, a that'll new... That'll be out next week, right? Yeah, <laughs> next week. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> but I... Um, so I, I mean, I think it's bringing in together a lot of things that I've said before, but bringing in some new insights. And hopefully in kind of a, 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 a short enough book that people will want to read it and kind of set it in a way that will bring out some of these ideas. And then I would also like to do the same thing with, you know, what I've said about priesthood, to maybe now say it in a different way um, that can speak to us right now. And I see these as kind of two short books that... Well, and I know you're working on a book with Matt Harris too, right? Well, the, the, the thing with Matt Harris, and we've talked about some of these ideas, so Matt and Noel Bringhurst so Matt Harris and Neil Bringhurst are editors for a book about scholarly responses to the church gospel topics essays. So they have a scholar that responds to each of the gospel topics essays, and mine responds to Joseph Smith, women, priesthood, and the temple. And basically what I'm doing, and I've said some of the ideas already, is I say that... Um, um, that in the church essay, they try to say that Joseph Smith's views on priesthood are exactly like what the church leaders say today. And I'm trying to say, well, with all due respect, again, my point is not to, but it's, I'm trying to say it's more complex and that they ignore certain crucial pieces of historical evidence that really show a different view of priesthood and the temple and women, which, of course, I think it's more of what I've tried to explain today. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I think maybe one of the good things about it for your readers is that, and I think Signature Books is going to publish that. Okay. Yeah, so who knows when it'll be out. Yeah. We wrote those essays like two or three years ago. It's taken a while. But I document everything. So you can see all the original sources in the essay. So I think that that's, you know, well, for I'm looking forward to people that. who are historians will like that aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Well, this has been a fun talk. Thank you, Rick, for having been, me here. It's been fun. <laughs> and I might have to get you again. I would be happy to do that right. if you can think of some follow-up things. And All right. <laughs> but thank you for having me. Well, thanks and for I hope I didn't offend it. anybody. <laughs> that wasn't my intent, right? I'm trying to be... Um, you know, and I'm not even one who tries to rile people up that much. I just want us to think mm -hmm. and to, re to explore and to look at the depth of things. So, thank oh, you. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks for participating yeah. on Gospel Yeah, you're very Texas. welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano. Margaret, I'd like to thank you for spending so much time and being so generous with your time. I might have to get you on again, so it was, it was fantastic. Uh, also, let me just mention, if you don't have her book, Strangers in Paradox, you should get a copy of it. It's a great book. So you'll, learn, you'll definitely learn a lot.
In our next conversation, I'd like to introduce Gene Adams. He's a, an expert on a group sometimes called the Hedrickites. They're the owners of the Temple Lot. I was surprised to find out that Gene had a family connection to this group. My wife is a Hedrick, and she said she had never told that to anybody because no it, had, it had some connotations that weren't what she wanted to convey when she was a convert herself at 14 in Los Angeles. Oh, really? And, uh, because I don't think very many people know who Granville Hedrick was. No, no. That's so, interesting that she was kind of hiding that. So after, after she had been baptized, her mother sat down and told her about her Mormon history. No way. Yeah. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.